I have a koan for you. It's me. It's my Versace suit. It's the ancient world of Japan, Tibet, and the Orient. What do these two things have in common? On the surface, nothing. A koan is a meditative device that we use to expand our awareness field. The idea is quite simple. There are two things that seem like they have nothing to do with each other. But if we contemplate them long enough, if we find an interrelationship, we go to a new level of mind, a new level of understanding. And that level of understanding will not just reflect in that situation, but in all parts of our lives. So I am your Cohen. Today I would like to talk to you about meditation. Meditation is the ancient, ancient science of stilling the mind, making the mind absolutely quiet and still like a lake without ripples. Let's face it, most people are not very happy. We all smile, we do our best with life, we put our best foot forward. But in reality, most people aren't very happy. And the reason is really simple. They're not in touch with their inner self. They're not in touch with the ocean of light, peace, and ecstasy and perfection that in Buddhism we call nirvana. In Taoism they call the Tao. In Hinduism they call Brahman or the Atman. In the West we call it God. Some people call it nature. Call it what you will. There is a force. There is an energy. There's something perfect about this thing we call life. And we're very close to it. Now, I'm a former university teacher. I have a PhD, a master's degree, a bachelor's degree. I went to school for a long time. And one of the things that I personally found very interesting about the university system was that while we teach people a lot of classes, and this is true of grammar school and high school and junior high school and technical schools, we teach wonderful classes, but you know what we don't do? We don't teach people how to learn. For some reason, we take it for granted that you just are born with the ability to study, to take notes, to know how to take a test, to know how to learn a foreign language, to know how to interact with people. It's the same, isn't it, with marriage? Somehow you meet somebody you like, they look good, you look good, you hit it off, you have a couple great dates, and somehow miraculously, once you go through the ceremony and you've sent out the invitations, you two are supposed to get together and it's all just supposed to work. Life doesn't really work that way, does it? I think the first thing that we should offer a fresh person in a university, I think we should start it in first grade, is a class in how to learn, how to study, how to make the most out of our resources, our educational resources. Well, in the Far East, thousands of years ago, this idea occurred to people. They looked at life. They saw the cycle of birth, growth, maturation, death. And people said, there must be more than this. There has to be more than this. There's a better way to do this. You can experience more happiness you can experience more ecstasy. So first they looked at the physical world and they said, well, maybe we can make the world into what we want. If we get control over our environment, if we have everything we want, we'll be happy. Well, that's very hard to do, let's face it. And even some people who managed to do it found out that they still weren't happy. So then they did a little more research and they found out that, you know, the funniest thing, happiness comes, in most cases, from inside our mind. You can be in a luxurious setting, you can be in an impoverished setting, you can be in a middle class setting, but if you're not happy inside your mind, you're not happy at all. So they directed their attention, ancient seers in the Far East, to the mind. They said, before we go out and do everything we can do in life, let's learn about the mind. Let's discover its potential. Let's develop it. Let's see what we can do. It's like giving that kid who's going to college for the first time a class in how to take tests, how to learn a foreign language, uh, how to select a good professor, how to be inspired. What do you do when you have a depressing day and your boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with you and you've still got to write that great paper and get that A to succeed in a competitive society? So in the Far East they did something similar. They researched the mind and they found out that the mind is a very wonderful, beautiful, complicated thing. 
And the major problem that people have, the part of the mind that they don't get to, the beautiful part, is beyond thought. The mind is something that's always in motion. Sit by yourself for a moment. Think. Try not to think. You'll notice you're always thinking something. You're worried about tomorrow, paying the bills, seeing somebody you'd like to see, remembering something that happened in the past, feeling guilty, feeling expectation. You know your feelings and your thoughts. On the other side of feeling and thoughts is something else, not nothingness, everythingness. So they devoted their time and energy in the Far East to developing techniques, which I'm going to teach you today, Techniques that will enable you to make your mind quiet, to make your mind like a lake without any ripples, absolutely still. Because when there are ripples in the lake, you can't see anything but the surface. But you know, when those ripples stop and everything calms down, you can see into the depths of the lake. I would like to teach you to look into the depths of yourself, and I'm afraid you're going to be shocked. You're going to find out that you're much more beautiful than you realize, that that this thing we call life is much more fantastic than you can imagine, and that you can be happy even in the most adverse circumstances if you can do this one thing. Learn to make your mind quiet, still your thoughts, because then it's as if a curtain opens, and behind that curtain is light, ecstasy, perfection, beauty, and reality. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's only life, and we all live forever. So you are going to learn today how to meditate. And if you practice, I can tell you based on my own experience that you are going to have a wonderful life, a wonderful life. Regardless of what happens outside of you, you're going to have a wonderful life. So I'd like you to come with me to the ancient Far East, where for a few minutes we're going to talk about why we meditate, and then we're going to have a little session in how to meditate where I will show you techniques that long after you've seen this video, you can practice on your own every day, quiet your mind, and gain power, control, energy, and happiness with. Thank you. Welcome to the Himalayas. This is where Buddhist meditation really began. Actually, it started in Nepal. There's something about the mountains that's magical. There's a power, a force that you can feel coming out of the mountains. I love mountains personally. I love climbing mountains, sitting on top of them, meditating. I like just reading about them. They are a plateau. They are meditation. What is meditation anyway? What we're doing is we are going up to a higher plateau of vision. We can see things that we can't see perhaps when we're down in the valley. That's essentially what meditation is. So we climb up the mountain, whether it's an internal mountain or an external mountain. We get above the smog, the noise, the congestion, and we have a view, perhaps a more realistic view. We see the panorama of life spread before us. We see that life is beautiful, the stars are above us, the horizon is endless. At the same time, we get a sense of how small we are, how insignificant in a way we are, how transient we are, how fleeting we are. So mountains teach us two things. They teach us that life is much broader than perhaps we think about uh, every day when we're at the office, when we're shopping, when we're dealing with the kids, when we're in rush hour traffic. We forget that the universe goes on forever. At the same time, sometimes we just get so caught up in the internal dramas and struggles of our own personal lives, our happiness, our unhappiness, our emotion. We magnify everything to such a large superstructure that we forget that we're just a very, very small part of life an important part, but a small part. Now, in my opinion, the forest teaches us something entirely different. And a lot of meditation in the Far East was learned in the forest. The forest is the symbiosis of nature, plants, animals, trees creating oxygen for us to breathe. And to a certain extent, I don't think this is news to you, we've lost touch with that whether it's cutting down the rainforest, whether it's cutting down any forest. 
we have lost our balance with nature. The balance that we've really lost, though, begins inside ourselves. And we find that balance in meditation. Meditation is repatching our circuitry. We're creating a symbiosis with the energies of life. Now, I like vacations. I don't know about you. Uh, you work 50 weeks out of the year, 51, and then you get a vacation. You hop on a plane, or you get the car out, or you go camping, you go to Hawaii, or maybe you just put on some videos and sit back on the couch, whatever's a vacation for you. I like vacations. But you know I have a problem. My problem is that I only get to go on vacation two weeks out of the year, and then for 50 weeks out of the year I've got to work. That means I've got to deal with traffic, I've got to deal with uh, unhappy people. My life sometimes, I feel like I'm working at a large department store right after Christmas and everybody's returning everything and there's a long line and everybody's mad at me. Do you feel like that sometimes? That's what modern life is. So how can I be on vacation all the time? I want to be out in the forest all the time. I want to be on the mountain all the time. Well, the secret is meditation. When we meditate, we take a vacation. We, in effect, take our mind, take our spirit, and we take it to an entirely different location. We take our spirit, perhaps, to the mountains. Suddenly, we're up on top of a mountain, and we learn something new. Now, I, I ski a little bit. I don't know about you. And I'm not the greatest skier in the world, that's for sure, but I like it. The way they teach you to ski is they start you out on what they call the bunny slope. You start out on a slope that is very gradual. If you fall, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a little snow on you and then you'll look like a professional skier who just came off the expert slope. And you learn to ski. You learn all the real movements. Uh, you learn snow plow maybe first, stem Christi, parallel jump, all on the bunny slope, all in a safe environment. The next step is we go up a little higher on the mountain to the intermediate slope, once we've mastered the bunny slope, and we do the same things. Then eventually, we go up to the expert slope, and we learn to do the same things on the expert slope. Well, that's what meditation is like. When you meditate, you first learn to meditate in a controlled environment, and that's where we're going to go in a few minutes. We're going to see how you can close your eyes in the safety and comfort of your own living room or bedroom or wherever you'd like to be outside in the backyard, you can close your eyes and that's the bunny slope. You can practice stilling your mind, go to the mountains, uh, go to a lake, go to a forest, go someplace beautiful to another dimension, a world of light, of peace, of joy and ecstasy, and during your meditation experience, bring that into your life. Then, once you've mastered that skill in a controlled environment, what you can do is go to the intermediate slope. You can go to work. You can be in rush hour traffic. You can be dealing with uh, a difficult situation. And you can bring the control you've gained and the energy from meditation into that environment. In other words, you can be in the office and be in a state of meditation, yet be on the phone, deal with complicated situations, deal with the complexities of life, hostile situations, in fact, with peace tranquility, pose, decorum, and power. Now, I like lakes. I don't know about you. I kayak a little bit. I love to swim. Uh, I was born in California, right by the ocean. I don't know, maybe that's it. Two-thirds of the world's surface <laughs> is water. And we can learn a lot of things from water. Water always seeks the path of least resistance. Uh, water gradually wears down things. Uh, it's patient. The Grand Canyon was formed by a little tiny stream flowing over thousands and thousands of years. So meditation is learned gradually. There's a flow of energy, a flow of power, of internal key, of ecstasy that's around us, but we don't perceive it with our senses. We can't see it with our eyes or feel it with our body or smell it or touch it or taste it but it's just outside of sense perception. There's a lake that's just inside of you, or outside of you, if you will. And when you can stop thought, when you can make your mind still, a curtain parts and there's the lake and you're there and you're kayaking or swimming or sitting by it or just looking at its beauty. 
You learn it, as I said before, first practicing at home. Then you can be in rush hour traffic and with your eyes on the road and with better dexterity. You can be at that lake. You can experience higher light, higher peace, higher joy. You can bring an ecstasy into your life. In other words, instead of taking a vacation for just two weeks, you can be on vacation 52 weeks out of the year wherever you are wherever your physical body may be, you can be at the lake, in the mountains, or in the forest. I think my favorite place, I mean, I have to be honest, is the desert. Now, the desert may seem like a barren place to you, but I love the desert. Meditation has taught me to love the desert. It's taught me to love many things that you might overlook in life. I certainly did. Because I was so filled with my thoughts and my worries and my problems and how are things going to work out and the pain of life and you know, the thrill of victory and the agony of success or vice versa that I didn't notice things that were beautiful. Most people think of a desert as a place that you drive through as fast as you can. There's cactus, there's a, some snakes, there's nothing there. Well, I don't think it was just because I was born in California and raised near a desert because it wasn't until I started to meditate that I really experience that the desert is a place that perhaps has more life than a city. When I go to the desert, there's an ecosystem of life there. There's a matrix, a web of life. There are plants, there are animals. If my mind is still, I can feel the wind. I can feel different dimensions. I can feel energy. I think I'm more alive in the desert or in the mountains in the forest than any place. And I've learned to find the desert working in the office. I've learned to find the desert when I'm attacked on the street. I've learned to find places that you would think there's no beauty. Places that you might think are ugly. I found beauty because when my mind is quiet, I become in touch with an internal power, a beauty, a radiance in which everything glows, in which everything is ecstasy. So I find the desert is filled with life. I find beauty in the darndest places. Meditation will teach you to still your mind, to have energy, to be optimistic even in trying situations, to deal with the difficulties of both life and death happily. And maybe you'll be able to go to the desert and see that the desert is not a dry place. It's not a barren place. No place is that. The world is teeming with life, energy, and beauty if we can only still our minds, get past our thoughts, look around ourselves, and just see and embrace the ecstasy of the universe. For me, that's what meditation is about. And now, I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you to the bunny slope, and I'm going to show you how you can start meditating every day. A very simple method, the bunny slope. And gradually, if you practice it, you'll get up to the intermediate slopes, and maybe someday, you'll be an expert. But let's go to the bunny slope for a few minutes. Come with me, and I'll show you how to meditate. Welcome to the bunny slope. I'm going to teach you how to meditate. Well, I think that's rather presumptuous on my part. I think what I'm going to try and do is show you how you can teach yourself how to meditate, the basic steps in learning how to meditate. Again, let's come back to what is meditation? Well, ultimately, the graduate school of meditation is what we call samadhi. It's a Sanskrit word. Simply, it means the absence of all thought. No thought, no thought of no thought, no thought of the fact that there's no thought of no thought. Absolute stillness, voidness. You go beyond the body, you go beyond the world, you be it, go beyond thoughts, worries, problems, and fears, and you just merge with the cosmic all. You merge with light, with nirvana, perfection. That's the graduate school. That's the expert slope. But at the moment, we're down here on the bunny slope, and this is where we all start. And I'll tell you a secret. I like the beginning as much as the ending. I like the bunny slope. I like teaching basic meditation as much as I do teaching the most advanced student. Because what meditation is about is progressing, feeling better, and overcoming your limitations. And the wonderful thing about it, from my point of view, is that it's not something that you have to be really great at to derive benefit from. Meditation is not something that you're going to have to practice for a year before you start to see results. You'll see results the first time you meditate, perhaps not overwhelming, but they'll be there. 
The second time you meditate, you'll find more results. The third time, more. Practice makes perfect, yes, and eventually I'm sure that they'll be building uh, statues of you someday, uh, and you may be the next Buddha. But for me, meditation is a very personal thing, and it involves steps. We talk about meditation as the pathway to enlightenment. The pathway to enlightenment is not something that happens all at once. We read stories about the Buddha and he sat under the bow tree for 28 days and experienced enlightenment. And that's great. But to be honest with you, the way you learn to do anything, the way you learn to meditate, the way you learn to paint a picture, the way you learn to drive a car, is in steps and stages, a little bit at a time. And every time we learn a little more, we know a little more and we are a little more. So meditation is something that you don't have to be an expert at. That's what's really exciting about it. I want you to get the sense, we call it beginner's mind, and I hope you never lose it, that from the very, very first session that you have in meditation, you've done something remarkable. Now let me digress for a minute, okay? I have a few minutes here if, if you'll indulge me, because this is what really matters. I can show you the techniques. I will. You're a captive audience. I've got you on video. But let me tell you something that I've learned about meditation, something very, very, very fascinating. What meditation is really about is self-esteem. Some people smoke cigarettes. When I was 16, I smoked cigarettes. Everybody in high school smoked cigarettes. We didn't have warning labels even on the packs then. I guess I'm getting older. I smoked cigarettes because everybody did. Camels, two packs a day. And then when I was about 17 and a half, I noticed that I was having trouble running. And I noticed I got these nicotine stains on my fingers. And I noticed I didn't feel so good. But everybody was smoking cigarettes. It was socially acceptable. It was the thing to do. Peer group pressure, I guess it's called. So I made a decision. I looked at people who didn't have nicotine stains on their fingers. I looked at people who didn't smoke cigarettes. And they didn't run out of breath when they went up steps as fast as I did. When we ran in gym class and we ran a mile, uh, they, they ran a little faster. Or at the end, they felt better. So I made a decision. I made a very important decision. And I'd like to share it with you because it's something that I think you should decide to do. I decided to live and not to die. I decided to live and not to die. And I think we make that decision, maybe we don't think it out, but it's something that you're deciding every day by what you do, how you treat your body, your mind, and our planet, and the people in your lives. Now, meditation, yes, it's about stopping thought. Yes, it's about, in a sense, going beyond all this and experiencing ecstasy. But yes, in a sense, it's not at all. It's about self-esteem. So I decided that I was worth living for, and every time that at the tender age of 16 when I had a cigarette, I was saying, I don't want to live anymore because this is bad for me and I know it and I'm doing it anyway. I don't like life because life hurts. Now, I think that's a very incorrect view of existence. So I one day just said, wait a minute. You know what I believe in? I believe in life. I believe in feeling good and maybe everybody else doesn't, but I'm going to. So I quit smoking and that was a statement that I made. My statement was, I want to live. I want to experience what's there. I want to know about life. And that's what you do when you meditate. You have 24 hours in a day. And during that 24 hour period, you can do a lot of different things. But how much of the time in that 24 hours do you say, I am improving myself I deserve to feel good, um, I matter, life matters, I want to live. We live in a society where people, uh, I don't think they want to live very much. Look at the way they treat the planet, look at the way they treat each other, look at the way they treat themselves. There's something very wrong here. Maybe we can't change everybody's life, but maybe we can change our own. That's the theory behind yoga, is you can start with yourself. And if it works with you, well, if you're inspired, you can share it with someone else. I'm inspired, it works for me, so I'm sharing it with you. So I came to a decision 
when I was 16 years old, and that was that life was worth living. And so I quit smoking. I started meditating. I decided that I was worth investing in. And you can hear my video here and watch it on how to meditate, and then you can put it in your video library and never do it. But what are you really saying? You're saying that you don't want to live. You're saying that it's not worth improving your life. We have to start from a position of belief. Life can be very beautiful or it can be very, very painful. It usually isn't anywhere in between. It's one or the other. So I chose life, and I will always choose life, because there is nothing else. Even, even death, in a way, is a form of life. So when you sit down and practice meditation, each time you are making a positive statement about yourself. You're saying, I am worth investing in. I am worth, I mean, it sounds ridiculous to say it, I realize, but you're saying, I deserve to feel good. I deserve to feel good. There's nothing wrong with that. Suffering does not bring happiness. It doesn't bring happiness. It just brings suffering. What brings happiness is happiness. What brings happiness is effort towards something that's real, that's actual, that's not hype, that will lead you to a place that will give you an enhanced life. Now, there's many things out there. You know, there's, there's self-help courses, and there's this, and there's that, and whatever works, great, do it. Uh, you know, sure. But there's one thing that I have tried personally that works, and I've taught it to over half a million people, and a lot of other people have been teaching it long before I arrived on this planet, and it works, and it's called meditation. And it's so simple that you'll think, well, why wouldn't I do this if it's, do this, if it's going to do everything that, you know, it's going to give me inner peace, energy, uh, total control of my mind, personal power, uh, control of my emotions so I can experience happy things, yet I won't lose my sensitivities to others, I'm not going to be spaced out, I'm going to be in control, develop a sense of humor. Oh, I can go on and on with wonderful things that meditation will do for you. That's not the issue. It's all true. But are you going to meditate? Are you going to try what I'm going to suggest? So I'm going to kind of, uh, I'm going to mess with your mind a little bit here, if I may, just for a second. What I'm going to suggest is that if you don't meditate, you want to die. And if you do meditate, you want to live. If you smoke cigarettes, why don't you just, just say it? You, you want to kill yourself. It's a, it's a good, quick way. There are lots of ways. You can drink yourself to death. You can do drugs. You can do a lot of things. And what you're saying is that I want to die. And you're making a mistake because life is beautiful. And just today, you're having a tough day or a tough week or a tough month or a tough incarnation. I know a way to change that. And it's so simple, but you won't do it unless you sit down and think to yourself, am I worth living for or not? Forget about other people for a minute. Don't be too idealistic. I'm sure you're a Mother Teresa in there somewhere. But you have to start with yourself. It's great to teach the world, but I think you're a hypocrite if you don't know what you're teaching. So let me teach you how to meditate. But what I'm trying to tell you, the real secret here, is caring about yourself, feeling that you're worth putting forth effort for, that a smile is something that you deserve. And it's not the easiest thing to get in a world like this. So believe in yourself, believe in life, and you will have difficult times, and you will age, and there will be disappointments, and loved ones will die, and life is not fair. Anybody who tells you that hasn't done much living, or they're trying to sell you something. Life isn't fair, but in spite of that, if you learn to meditate, you will gain an understanding of the meaning of life, not just some intellectual understanding. You will know it. You will experience it. You will go into the depths of the universe and come to know who and what you really are. You will see that you are deathless, that you're an immortal spirit, temporarily in a physical body, and that life even with its pains and difficulties, can be ecstasy. And it's done through meditation. And if you find a better way, please let me know. I'm always interested in learning something new. How do you meditate? Well, I always start by taking my shoes off. Now, you don't have to take your shoes off. You can keep your shoes on, 
and just sit in a chair. But what you don't want to do is lie down. When you lie down to meditate, if you're just to stretch out on a bed or something, uh, or on the beach, and you're going to try and meditate, what's going to happen is you're going to relax. And I know there are people who tell you that meditation is relaxation. As a matter of fact, there's a very popular brand of meditation, which I need not name, and they say that meditation is relaxation. And I totally disagree. Meditation has nothing to do with relaxation. Well, of course you'll be relaxed from it. But meditation involves a certain degree of effort and concentration. It's work. You'll feel relaxed afterwards. You'll feel great. You'll have power, mental clarity. You'll be in happy states of mind. You can travel to other dimensions. You can experience nirvana. Depends on your interest. But meditation is not relaxation. And when you lie down, what happens is we're used to it. We're habituated to it. We relax. I lie down in bed and, oh, gosh, I want to go to sleep. You see? All my muscles relax. That's not meditation. If you're a very advanced meditator, maybe you can do that. But in the beginning, you want to sit up straight. Now, this is a half lotus position. Full lotus position is if I put the other foot up. Okay, we'll start with half. I don't want to intimidate you. You don't have to do this. You can keep your feet on the floor. You can wear your shoes if you want to. But be comfortable. Dress comfortably. I'm comfortable in a tuxedo. You might not be. Whatever is comfortable, put on. Hey, if you want to meditate naked and no one's watching, you can. Or maybe somebody's watching and you can make a video and make a lot of money. I don't know. You know, it's America. <laughs> what matters is to be comfortable. Wear something comfortable, something that does not feel physically restrictive. If you are uncomfortable in this position, put your feet on the floor and sit in a chair. You can sit on the floor if it's comfortable. But your back has to be held straight. This is very, very important. Most people in the West because of our lifestyle, have very weak back muscles. I used to teach yoga classes, standing on your head, doing all that kind of stuff. And most yoga really is directed towards developing the back muscles. So in the beginning, you should expect to feel a little bit uncomfortable when you sit down to meditate. So my suggestion is, if you're sitting, trying to sit up straight, and theoretically you shouldn't be leaning against anything, if it feels very uncomfortable, lean a little bit, okay? Don't lean like this. Don't slump. You won't meditate well. Lean a little bit. If you're on the floor, you can lean against the wall. Okay? If you're in a chair, you can lean against the back of the chair. But eventually, try and sit up, even if it's just for a minute or two at a time, without leaning. These muscles will come back. They'll get quite strong after a while. The reason is because there's an energy flow that takes place from the base of the spine to the top of the head. And when your spinal column is straight, the energy flow is smoother, it's better. The key, what we call the kundalini, the power, an internal power, flows better. Plus you're more alert. So ideally, you'd be sitting like this. But don't be concerned, you can sit in a chair, you can lean to start with. But gradually, try, you know, sitting up a little straighter. And if you can't fold your legs like this, go down to the local Y and take a yoga course or get a yoga videotape and it's, you'd be amazed how fast these muscles will loosen up. Even if you're 50, you'd be amazed how fast you can bring these muscles and tendons into shape and sit like this because it's very balanced, it's very comfortable. A full lotus for most Westerners is uncomfortable because unless you've done it at, at, from childhood on through, you know, the, the knees get a little tight. This, this is really quite adequate. Now what is it that we're trying to do? Ideally, we are going to stop our thoughts. We're not going to have any thought in the mind. Try it. It won't work. So what we do is we learn to do it in stages. What meditation initially is really about is not about stopping thought. That'll happen when it happens. What meditation is really about is learning to concentrate in the beginning. And there are three primary areas for concentration. We call them chakras. There are really seven of them. There's one at the base of the spine. There's one about halfway between the navel area and the base of the spine. There's one in the center of the chest. There's one around the base of the throat. There's one between the eyebrows and a little bit above. We call the third eye. And then there's one where all the curls are, in my case, and that's called the crown chakra. There's seven of them. But 
in reality, you really only have to be concerned with three. The area of the navel, or about an inch or two below, the center of the chest, and between the eyebrows and a little bit above. When you focus on these three points, when you practice concentration, it picks up all the other chakras. How do you start a meditation session? Sit down, wear something comfortable, maybe wash your hands and face before, take a shower, if it feels good to feel clean. If you can't do that, just sit down. You really don't need incense. If you like it, you can light some. You really don't need candles. You can do that if you like ritual. I don't bother personally. I just sit down in a clean, comfortable place, usually on the floor. For the video, it looks better if I'm in a chair with this wonderful background, obviously. So sit down. Sit up nice and straight. Lean if you need to. Then what you're going to do is close your eyes. And you're going to focus on the area around your navel, about an inch below. There's a power spot there. There's an energy center. It's not really in your physical body. It's in what we call the subtle physical body. The subtle physical body is the aura. It's a secondary body that we have of energy that surrounds and protects our physical body. So, it, and it's very complicated. It's made up of fibers of light. These fibers join at specific places that we call chakras. So if you focus your attention, that is to say, if you feel this area below the navel, okay, and you focus on it, you'll begin to tap into a very deep key power. Martial artists know about this. If you've started, studied any martial arts, you know that normally when you go to a martial arts studio and before uh, you, know, you start work out, they have you sit. Sometimes, of course, you can meditate in a kneeling position, you know, where you sit back against your feet. That's more of a Japanese style. And you focus here because it releases power. This is the center of power. The chest center is the center of balance and happiness. The third eye is the center of wisdom and knowledge. These are the three component parts to meditation that we need. We need power to get started. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. We need happiness because power without happiness and balance goes astray. Uh, terrible things happen. And we need wisdom because even happiness can go astray. We need wisdom, we need balance, happiness, and we need power. You put those three together, they're an unbeatable combination. So in a meditation session, we take time focusing on these three areas. These areas, it's hard to put in words. You'll have to feel it. But when you meditate and focus on these three areas, what you're really doing is tapping into other dimensional planes, other fields of energy, just like there are subatomic particles and quarks and all kinds of wonderful things that we can't see with our eyes. So there are other fields of energy that are not visible to the senses, but they're there. When you focus on the navel center, the chest center, and the third eye, you are bringing those fields of energy into your body. Now, it's a good idea when you meditate not to eat too much first. If you go out and you have uh, you know, a pizza or something like that, you're going to feel all that pizza sitting there. It's going to be very hard to meditate. On the other hand, if you're absolutely famished, if you're hungry, you're not going to think about peace, light, and ecstasy. You're going to think about pizza <laughs> or whatever your favorite food is. So in the beginning, it's best to, you know, if you're really hungry, just have a little bite to eat, but don't eat a lot. Sit down, close your eyes, and focus on the area of the navel or below the navel. Now, when I say focus, you don't have to visualize anything. You can. You can use visualizations. They're good for some people. For some people, uh, they're hard and, and they're cumbersome. But when you first start, there's a very simple thing you can do. Take your hand, right or left, and place it. Try, try it right now. Take your hand and place it right below the area. This is also how you know whether you should go to Nutrisystems or not. Uh, take your hand and place it around your navel area and a little below, right there. Press very, very gently. Feel that spot, feel that area. Now close your eyes, and as you close your eyes, feel, just, just for a second, you don't need to see me, close your eyes, and feel that spot. You are now meditating. It was that hard. Now let's take our hand and move it to the center of the chest, okay? Right around the center of the chest. Uh, just press very lightly, center of the chest. You can be off an inch or two. Let's not be too fussy. Press right here, very lightly, very gently. Close your eyes just for a second. Guess what? You're meditating. Now, 
take your hand again and go up between the eyebrows and about an inch above. Press very gently. Close your eyes. Guess what? You're meditating. You just did three meditations. Congratulations. When you first start to meditate, I think it's a very good idea to place your hand on these areas. We're going to do it naturally for a little bit longer than that. And you will find it's very easy with a very gentle pressure to bring your mind to this spot. When you're starting to meditate, I would recommend that you meditate for 15 minutes at a clip. Do a 15-minute session. Five minutes here, five minutes here, five minutes here. If you'd like to, you can just take your watch and take it off and put it someplace you can see it. Or have a clock around or just guesstimate five minutes. Eventually, you'll sit longer. Eventually, the ecstasy becomes so profound and so powerful and so incredible that you out go outside of time and space. There is no time. There is no space. You will go into states of mind that are so perfect and so ecstatic that an hour could go by, and it won't have been a second. Einstein said a, an interesting thing. Somebody once said, what's the theory of relativity? And he said, well, you, know what, you want to know what relativity is? I'll tell you. He said, if you talk to a beautiful woman, if you're a man, or a handsome man, if you're a woman, uh, for an hour, it seems like a minute. If you sit on a hot stove for a minute, it seems like an hour. He said, that's relativity. So in the same sense, what you will find is when you start to meditate, you'll be a fidget. When you start to meditate, the five minutes will seem like it'll take forever. Then you'll find a funny thing will happen if you practice once a day, or maybe even twice if you're you know, a real go-getter. You will find that you'll look at the clock, and 15 minutes went by, and you thought it was five. And the reason was relativity. Uh, you felt ecstatic. You felt beautiful. You felt wonderful because key energy is flowing through your body. It's renewing you. You're at peace. You're in the mountains. You're at the lake. You're in the forest. And all of that energy is coming into you. And when you finish your meditation, it goes with you into your life. So what I would suggest is you sit down in a comfortable position, close your eyes when you meditate, and for five minutes to start out with, for the first few times, place your hand there and very gently press and just try and feel that spot. It's really that simple. Needless to say, countless thoughts are going to go through your mind. I mean, I can remember when I started meditating and I didn't really know how many things there were to think about other than meditation until I tried to think about meditating. And I'm sure you'll experience the same thing. Don't be concerned. If you are trying if you are focusing at all, if you are feeling the spot, you're strengthening your mind, you're directing your will, and you're drawing an invisible field of energy into your body, mind, and spirit. You may not feel it initially while you're doing it, but you'll notice half an hour, hour after you've meditated, time has gone by, you will notice that suddenly you will feel brighter, better, and more ecstatic. I think music is very, very good. I write and compose music for meditation. Uh, you can meditate to the music that I make. Uh, you can find just a piece of music that helps you. Some people like silence. But music is good because it helps block out just a lot of external noise. So I usually have a little CD or cassette playing. Or if I'm in a very beautiful place, if I'm out in the forest and there's no traffic and you don't hear the people next door, then maybe I don't need that. Nature is enough. Sit, focus here for five minutes. When thoughts come in and out of your mind, ignore them. Don't fight with your thoughts, because that's more thought. Just ignore it. And you'll find, over a period of time, as you focus more and more on your navel center, your chest center, and your third eye, that you'll have less thought. Don't fight with your thought. Instead, focus. And as your focus becomes more intense and you release more energy, you'll notice the most incredible thing. You'll notice that you will start to lift up into a higher state of mind in which there's no thought. Go with the energy, not against it. Don't try and swim upstream. Go with the stream. Don't fight your thoughts. Simply ignore them and instead focus. These are very powerful energy centers. And with practice, you will release more and more energy and you will go into higher and higher meditative states. So once again, sit down. Don't eat too much first. Relax, take a breath, and focus here.
first five or six times you do it, put your hands here. After that, you won't need to. You'll find that you can just feel that spot and focus. Then after five minutes here, move up here. What you're doing is releasing ki and energy. And now it's going to flow to this area. And when you focus here, by itself, it will lift up to here. And you'll be bringing new energy in from this chakra of happiness. Suddenly, you'll start to feel uh, not just power, which you'll feel here. You'll start to smile. You'll feel good. Again, don't worry about your thoughts. Don't think, oh God, am I meditating right? Am I doing this right? I mean, you'll think those things. Don't let it distract you. Focus instead. Press here gently the first few times. Then go up to the third eye. Now here you may have some interesting experiences. Uh, this is the seat of ancient wisdom and knowledge of the Orient or wherever you happen to be from. Here you may see visions. You may see uh, worlds of light, dimensions of perfection. Be neither attracted nor repulsed. It doesn't matter what you see, the good, the bad, the ugly, or anything else. Ignore it. Just keep focusing. Then at the very end of your meditation, stop focusing here, stop focusing here, and stop focusing here, and just let go. Just sit there with your eyes closed and let go. When thoughts come in and out of your mind, just ignore them. Relax, and you'll find suddenly the world will go away, time and space will stop. At the end of meditation, we usually bow. It's an Eastern custom. I kind of like it. Just for a moment, we just kind of go like this. You don't have to. But we just go like this just for a moment. And it's our way of saying thank you to the universe, of saying thank you for giving me this energy, this life, this world, this opportunity to feel something. And thank you. That it's optional. And then get up, go about your day. The best time to meditate? is in the morning. When you first get up, if you meditate, take a shower, meditate for 15 minutes, maybe eventually half an hour, 45 minutes, you know, if you really get into it, you will develop power, concentration, focus, and your mind will begin to work in a way other people's minds don't work. You'll become very telepathic. You'll be able to read the minds of others. You'll be able to feel things before they happen. If you can't meditate in the morning to start out, the clock goes off, and oh yeah, I'd love to get up, but oh, boom, you hit the button. That's how I started. Then meditate in the evening, around sunset. Meditate before you go to bed. It's more important to meditate once a day for 15 minutes than every other day for two hours. It's doing it every day that gradually develops the power, the key. Gradually you will find that you will smile more, frown less, and if you just keep focusing, it sounds so simplistic, you will gradually still your mind and waves of light, peace, and ecstasy will flood you. You'll go above the plane of thought, yet you'll think more clearly when you need to. And most importantly, I think you will be making a decision to develop your mind. You are saying not no to this, that, or the other thing, but yes. You're saying, yes, I'm worth investing in. I want to develop my mind. I want to experience light. I want to experience happiness. I want to gain control of my existence. It's really that simple. If you do that, then the world will open to you. Believe in life. Believe in yourself. It doesn't matter what anybody else does. You're born alone and you die alone. The secret of life, well, I'm not going to tell you now. You have to figure that out. But I can tell you that you'll figure it out in the silence of your own mind when you've learned to stop thought. Well, I guess I got my vacation after all. Here I am on the big island in Hawaii. What a terrific place. Now, most people go to Hawaii, of course, just to swim and to make love and go on their honeymoons and just enjoy the island. But I teach meditation in Hawaii. I teach meditation in New Mexico, in the deserts, in cities, all kinds of places. Why Hawaii? Well, needless to say, I like to go for a swim as much as the next person. But there are certain places, we call them places of power on the earth. These are fabulous places. These are places where there's more energy available. For some reason, when you meditate in these places, aside from just going for a swim and doing some snorkeling. When you sit down to meditate, it's easier to stop your thoughts. We're back to the bunny slope concept. If we can learn to meditate, 
in the easiest environment possible, uh, we'll gain self-confidence, we'll gain some ability, then we can gradually go to more and more challenging environments. So I do seminars where I take people to Hawaii or sometimes out to the middle of the desert. When we go to Hawaii, particularly the big island because it's the least populated, it's very easy to meditate. You can sit and still your thoughts. It's very easy to do. You're out on an island 3,000 miles away from the mainland. There's just low population density. There just is not a lot of human, what we would call human aura. You don't, you don't feel people much. Maybe it's like the Earth was a long time ago before it got really too crowded, I think. And you know it's going to get more crowded. They're saying the population of the Earth is going to double by 2015. A lot of the stress that we experience is simply because the Earth is so crowded. So we go to Hawaii, we go to the desert, we go to places like that, and you can just do this with me or on your own, and we find a quiet place where the energies of the Earth help us, the key, the power of the Earth will actually help us enter into a meditative state. It's very easy to quiet the mind. At that point, then, when you go to the city, when you are back in your apartment, in your condo, or in your house, or wherever it may be, you'll find that it's really much easier to regain that state. If you went to Hawaii, if you went to the desert, if you went out into nature, into the forest, and you meditated, and you found it was easy to do there, now you know what to do. Now when you go back and you return to our urban metro world, it's really not that difficult to recapture that state. Think of it this way. Uh, I don't know if you play the piano at all, but when you play the piano, of course, the most important thing, you have to start with a piano that is in tune. The piano, all the keys resonate at the, at the proper octaves and frequencies. So the first thing that we do is we get a tuning fork, or we have somebody come over who tunes pianos, and they find middle C. Once they tune that, then they can tune the rest. Well, learning meditation is very much like that. Essentially what we want to do is we want to learn what stillness is like, what it's like to have an empty mind, what it's like to feel good again. I mean, there's so many things bombarding us, our minds, our bodies, noise, pollution, demands, traffic, uh, relationships. We've forgotten, I think almost as a race, what it feels like just to feel relaxed, to feel at peace, to feel tranquil, just to feel good about ourselves and daily living. So we go to Hawaii, we go to the desert, we go to the forest for short periods of time and of course it's naturally beautiful, to find the pulse of nature, to still ourselves down, to relax, to gain our poise and our balance, to feel that rhythm of life. Life is good. There's a goodness to life. Yes, there's violence. Yes, there's crime. Yes, there's horror. But then there's the forest, too. There's nature. I used to read a lot of Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau was one of my first inspirations for meditation, as a matter of fact. And he went out into the woods, and he built himself, for a period of time, a little house on Walden Pond. And he lived there for just about a year and a half or two years. He didn't stay there. For a while, he said he wanted to find out what it was like to just feel life again. And that's what he did. He built his little house. He went out there, he lived in Walden Pond, and he got back in touch with himself and with life. Now, did he stay out there? No, he went back to society. He moved back to Concord. But he was able to bring what he had gained from living in the forest and living in the woods back into his daily life and not lose touch with it again. And from time to time, of course, he called it sauntering. He liked to take walks in the woods to recapture it. So my theory of teaching meditation is it's something that you practice every day in your home, of course. But it's also something that you practice in nature. You need to go to power places. You need to go to the desert. You need to go to Hawaii. Uh, you need to go to the mountains for short periods of time because it's easier to meditate there. Unlike Thoreau, I don't think you have to go and build a house there and live there for a couple of years, maybe just a few days. And slow yourself down and practice meditation. Then you will find when you come back to your urban environment and your daily life, that you will be able, again, to recapture that feeling 
which brings us, of course, to the subject of intermediate meditation. Now, intermediate meditation is, how can I express it, uh, beyond thought, needless to say. Uh, it's like the most beautiful mountain and lake you've ever seen. We are now in the Grand Tetons. Okay? We're up in Wyoming. Uh, pristine nature, beautiful beyond comparison. Uh, this is one of America's most beautiful national parks. And that's what intermediate meditation is. Intermediate meditation is a stage where now you've been practicing maybe for a year or two, and much to your surprise, you've stopped thought. Now, of course, the funniest thing is once you stop thought, you start thought. And I have to explain that. All day long, you know, day after day, or 15 minutes a day, whatever, you're sitting there and you're trying to stop thought. Finally, one day, you stop thought. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to do what we all do. You're going to say, I've stopped thought. You're going to think it, and you're thinking again. Frustrating, I know. But you just gained ground. After a while, though, you're not going to think, I've stopped thought. You're going to stay in a thoughtless state. That is to say, the curtain will part, and you are going to go into a level of light, a dimension of incredible beauty. It's real. It's as real as anything physical, if not more so. And it's like visiting the Grand Tetons. It's like going to this wonderful lake, this wonderful mountain, where the purity, uh, the clarity, the ecstasy is even stronger. That's intermediate meditation. You'll sit down to meditate, focusing on the navel center, the chest center, the third eye, but the difference is you won't think. For five minutes, you will go into levels of light and an ecstasy that are absolutely beyond description. Then naturally, there's advanced meditation. Now, I can't possibly teach you advanced meditation at this stage until you've learned introductory meditation, intermediate meditation, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about it, if I could. Advanced meditation is the realization of nirvana. And what is nirvana? Nirvana is everything and nothing. But if I could have one central image for nirvana, it would be a plateau something that stretches out endlessly forever. It's an expanse. Life never stops. It never ends and it never begins. It has always been and it will always be. It's a vista that goes on forever. We think of ourselves as being separate. We're small, we're isolated, we're born, we die, and we feel separate and we feel alienated. But when you meditate in advanced meditation, what happens is this vista, which might at first seem kind of alienating, uh, the world is so big and I'm so small, we become the vista itself. We merge with it. Suddenly your mind is the universe. Suddenly you are the vista. Suddenly you've gone beyond self and there's no pain and there's no sorrow and there's no unhappiness, but there's joy and there's ecstasy and things I couldn't possibly put into words. Advanced meditation is nirvana. Nirvana is a Buddhist word. It may not mean much to you. But what it is, is to experience the brightness, the beauty, the wonderful disarray of perfect existence in every moment and beyond every moment. To be in time and space and beyond that at the same time. This is where advanced meditation takes you. It's a vista. It's a view that encompasses all things. It's beyond words. I have a PhD in English. I love language. I wouldn't even begin to try and describe it. But I know that if you follow the pathway to enlightenment, if you practice meditation, starting with our very simple bunny slope method of a few minutes here, a few minutes here, and a few minutes here, and gradually read books about it, learn about it, practice it more, go to power places, find the best teacher you can, myself or someone else, it doesn't really matter, whatever works. Eventually, you'll get to advanced meditation. Advanced meditation is nirvana. You will go beyond anything that's painful, anything that's ugly. You will see and become eternity. You will become light itself. That is the goal of Buddhism. That is the goal of all yoga. And I personally believe that's the goal of life, is to become life itself and life is indeed ecstasy. So I would encourage you to practice meditation 
and to follow the pathway to enlightenment, and above all, to take a first step, to make a choice to live.